I know you read the New York Times story. Did any of this surprise you? No, I think the idea that uh, that influence is bought and sold on, on Twitter has been known for at least four or five years now. Just how extensive is it? Um, I think the Times article did a great job of really getting deep into one particular instance. I, I believe that millions and millions of accounts, you know, by Twitter's own responses to the questions for the record following the Senate hearing, they were saying that in September they were taking on four million fake accounts per week, of which they were capturing about three million prior to them going live on the platform. That's still a substantial amount that d that do uh, participate in some way in public discourse in the, after the time that they're created. Now, Ramey, you specialize in bot detection and mitigation. You know, you know, what sort of information do you have about, you know, the numbers behind this, the sheer extent of these fake accounts? Well, to Twitter's admission, it, about 5% of their users is uh, made up of, of these fake accounts. I think other researchers have come up with higher numbers, 15 20%. Um, what's really interesting and important to note, it's not just about the volume of actual accounts, but the activity of those accounts. I think the impact of the fake accounts, because they're louder, they're tweeting more often, um, is much, much higher than being reported on or being talked about. And so um, I, I think what we're seeing, the impact of these fake accounts is uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent and, and more across uh, the social activity. And what do you know, Renee, about how you know what's happening on Twitter compares to what's happening on Facebook? It's a problem there as well. It is. I think Twitter, it's much more visible for a couple of reasons. One, um, even outside researchers have some visibility into what's happening on Twitter because it is so public. On Facebook, it's a lot harder to track that because so much of the communication is happening in private groups. Uh, I think also on Twitter, there's a sense that what happens on Twitter is amplified more because the media picks it up because a lot of journalists monitor the conversation on Twitter. So really, when we talk about kind of information integrity, uh, Twitter is an absolutely critical piece of, of that puzzle. So, you know, in terms of how easily influence can be manipulated, give us some examples. So I think one of the things, um, there's, there's two general frameworks for the type of manipulation that was covered in the Times article. The first is the idea, um, we as a society and in the media in particular, um, the notion that someone with a high follower count is a person of influence or should be taken more seriously. Um, that type of, you know, buying a, a large collection of followers really uh, can artificially, um, you know, artificially creates a metric of importance that, that we've come to accept and, and perhaps we shouldn't. And then the second, um, I think it's really the notion that Per the, uh, the other guest's point, these accounts are tweeting a lot more often, so there's almost an information laundering that's happening here. Mm -hmm. If I want to spread a particular point of view, I can simply go out and purchase some bots and make them say a particular thing. Like to um, vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I actually think it's important to note it's really not a partisan issue mm -hmm. at this point. We see this being done um, by corporates. You know, it's called astroturfing when that happens. We see it being done to corporates. Um, when companies kind of fall afoul of, of some sort of, uh, you know, social group, like the, the campaign against Ghostbusters is one example. So it's really more of a systemic problem, um, and, and that's why it needs to be addressed.